Many men and women in our world can't seem to find their purpose. They don't have a peace. They're not satisfied with their life. They feel incomplete and dysfunctional. And the reason is they're so far removed from God that they can't see him. They don't understand that they've been made in God's image and because they can't see God and they don't know him, they're unable to comprehend who they are and what their purpose in life should be. In Genesis 1, the Bible very plainly states God made everything. God made everything. God said, let there be light and there was light. There were no questions. There was no rebellion. There was no debate. There were no experiments or trial and error, but light came into existence just as God had imagined it and it shone according to God's command. The word says that God made two great lights, the sun to shine by day and the moon, the lesser light to shine by night and the evening and the morning was the first day. That was the beginning of time as we know it. God not only made his creation, and he named his creation, but he also assigned to the things that he created a divine purpose. God's creation wasn't in disorder or disarray. It wasn't a mess that had to be straightened out. It wasn't a puzzle that needed to be solved. And it wasn't still forming and evolving. But all of God's creation was a perfect, intricate, finished, working design. Are you with me so far? Well, not everybody. God not only made it, but he named it and he gave it a divine purpose. God created the firmament to separate the waters that were above the earth from the waters that were on the earth. He created dry land, which he named earth. He created the waters and called them seas. He created the grasses and the fruits and the times and the seasons, all in perfect harmony with a perfect purpose. And then God looked at everything that he had spoken into existence and he said, this is good. God bragged on himself because he had done such a fine job of creating. There were no mistakes. There was nothing unfinished, but everything, absolutely everything was as it should be, so much so that even God himself was impressed with his work. And then God said, let us make man in our own image. The words used here are extremely important. The scriptures inform us that the pattern that God used to make man was God himself. God made man in his own image and after his own likeness. That tells me that we human beings must be pretty special in God's eyes because he patterned us after himself. Now let me settle a controversy. The Bible says that God made man. Are you paying attention to the words here? It doesn't say that God made monkey. He did make monkey, but he didn't make monkey man. It doesn't say that he made a one-celled microorganism, even though God did make one-celled microorganisms. It doesn't say that he made a mistake that later corrected itself through a series of accidents and evolved into a human being. But the Bible clearly states that God made man perfect and complete in his own image and after his own likeness. There was no caveman. There was no Neanderthal man or Piltdown man. There was no missing link because God created man. If you're one of those Christians who tries to marry evolution with creationism, I feel sorry for you because your God must look a lot like King Kong and act like a fool. Before anything else in your life will make sense, you have to settle on the issue of creation. You have to start at the beginning. Before you can find your purpose in life, before you can find fulfillment in life, before you can find direction in life, you have to first come to grips with the fact that God created you in his image and he created you with a divine purpose. You are not just one of a few billion, but you are one in a few billion. God created man to not only have similar physiological appearance to himself, which makes me wonder what God looks like, but he also made man to have the same kinds of feelings and emotions that he has. So if you understand anything about yourself, you ought to be able to understand just a little bit about God. And the more that you understand about God, the more you will be able to understand about yourself. Now, the Bible says that God called man Adam. 
Adam is the Hebrew word for male, man. God named the first man Adam, not Grog, not Spot, not Amoeba. He called him Adam, the name of a complete, mature, and perfect male human being. Are you still with me? Don't let me lose you. Your children go to school, public school, and they're being taught on a regular basis that the earth began billions of years ago in a great explosion. They're being taught that man didn't come along until millions of years afterward as he evolved for thousands upon thousands of years from a microorganism. Your children are being taught a lie that is intended to erase God from their mind. So my question to you today is, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Is the only education that your children are getting about the creation of this world coming from the, the mouths of ungodly people? Or are you counter teaching with the word of God? God created Adam. He created man, but he didn't create a blank slate and say to Adam, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? God created Adam as a man, but as a man, Adam was lonely. And God noticed. You see, you can always tell when a man is alone because he's a pitiful sight. His clothes haven't been washed in days. Maybe he hasn't washed in days. I mean, nothing matches. He's eating lunch from a gas station. Backseat of his truck looks like it's a garbage bin. It's not good for a man to be alone. All you lonely guys out there that don't have a woman, all you gentlemen that spent last Valentine's Day with your dog, God knows that you're lonely. And God knows that it's not good that you're alone. Don't go bar hopping and sign up for some matchmaking website. Just sit back and allow God to do his thing, and he will bring an Eve to you because God knows that you need one. Adam was lonely because even with all of the beauty of nature around him, he wasn't satisfied. Something was missing. Adam couldn't quite put his finger on it, but God knew what it was. Adam was lonely because even with all of this animal life around him, not one of those animals was at his intellectual level. Not one could communicate with him. Not one could understand him or comfort him or deal with his emotions because unlike the animals, Adam was the only creature that was created in the image and likeness of God. Adam wasn't like some people today. He didn't kiss his dog in the mouth. I heard a guy say the other day, my, my wife will kiss a dog in the mouth, but she won't drink from my glass. <laughs> he didn't dress his cat up in baby clothes and push it around a stroller. Because Adam was intelligent enough to know that there was a massive difference between who he was and the rest of God's creation. Because he only was created in the image and the likeness of God. God said it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make Adam a helpmate. I will make somebody like him physically and intellectually and emotionally so he won't have to be alone. And God created woman. Not monkey woman, not cave woman. But God created human being woman, similar in nature and appearance to Adam, but distinctly different than a man. She was woe man. Because <laughs> I'm sure that when Adam first laid eyes on her, the first thing he said was woe man. <laughs> I ain't never seen nothing like that before. The Hebrew word for man is ish. And the word for woman is isha because Eve was taken out of the man's side. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. There's a connection there. Eve was a compliment to Adam. She was intended to be his other half. She was the part of him that was missing. She was the part of him that could see and feel and understand things that Adam as a man struggled with. But Eve, as a woman, knew naturally. God knew that he was going to do this all along. Eve wasn't an afterthought. God knew all along that he was going to make Eve. He just wanted Adam to first understand that he needed her and her to understand that she needed him. But here is what we miss. Here's what we miss. The creation of Adam and Eve was God's way of explaining to us the relationship that he wants with you and me. God is the groom and we are his bride. He desires us and we desperately need him. The sins of our day, homosexuality, adultery, molestation, and rape, aren't sexual sins. But they're sins of rebellion against God's design. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It's inverting and perverting what God created to be perfect. 
Our modern world wants all men and women to be the same, and many are pushing to make all men and women look alike and act alike and dress alike. They want to erase the distinct differences between men and women. Put them on the same job, stand them side by side in the military, put them in the same housing as though there is no difference, but there is a difference. Thank God there is a difference. The new agenda is trying to erase the distinct differences between men and women, but it's never going to work. A man can have a surgery and inject his body with female hormones and tell everybody he's now a woman, but chromosomes never change. Females have two X chromosomes, while males have one X and one Y chromosome. That fact can never be changed at all. Gentlemen, your wife compliments you, maybe not verbally. She may not brag on you and tell you how good of a husband you are. And ladies, I'll tell you, if you have a good one, you need to brag on him every now and then because there's a whole lot of women out there who are married to losers who would trade you in a second. Your wife might, all, might not always compliment you, but she completes you. She, can, she is everything that you are not. And some poor wives have a bigger job than others because their husbands leave a lot to complete. Now, I feel compelled to point out to you that God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's an old joke, but I'm going to keep telling it because people are missing the punchline. We can't purposely ignore God's design and expect blessing. We can't thumb our nose at God's order and God's instructions and expect to have a complete and fulfilled life. We, we can't be so arrogant or so bold as to subvert and pervert God's plan for man and woman and expect anything other than God's judgment for our rebellion against his design. God made you and he didn't make a mistake. You are a creation of the master creator. You were designed by the master designer and you were called into existence by the same voice that said, let there be light. You are an original, one-of-a-kind item. There has been nobody else like you before, and there'll be no duplicate after you. You're not a copy or a cheap imitation or a knockoff of somebody else, but you are a one and only, and there may be a whole lot of people out there that know you or be glad to hear that. God made you to be you, and nobody else can be you but you because you are the only you that you can be because God made you that way. Go ahead and write that down. There's a valuable truth that you need to understand. If God made you as an original, then God must also have an original plan for your life. He must have a plan that only you can fulfill, a plan that includes in it the heartaches and the pitfalls that you've gone through. A plan that is incorporated into it the valleys through which you have walked and the scars that you've received. Nothing that you've ever been through in your life has ever been out of control. Nothing has occurred outside of the box. Not one situation that you have faced or one trial that you've encountered has happened outside of God's sovereign control because you are divine design with a divine purpose. Now, what am I telling you here? I'm telling you don't be weary in the face of the enemy. Don't fear Satan's threats or surrender to his attacks. Don't worry and don't be afraid. Don't stress out, but in everything, as the word says, give thanks to God for this is his will in Christ Jesus concerning you. You were built and designed by God to handle your life. Nobody made, God didn't make anybody else like you. You were built and designed to handle your life. When God created you, he put things in you that he didn't put in other people. He made you and equipped you to handle everything that comes your way. You are divinely and uniquely designed by God to successfully traverse your life. Some of you have been put through the verb proverbial mill lately. And you need to understand that God knew what was coming in your life. And before he ever, you ever drew your first breath, God designed you with the tools to not only handle that situation, but also to conquer it. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made. Everything, everyone and everything that God created had a name and a purpose. God doesn't make mistakes. Of all of the things that God created, he didn't name any of them whoops or I don't know. Before you ever formed in your mother's womb, God had a divine plan and design for your life. He made you on purpose for a purpose, which just breaks my heart when we think of how many wasted promises we have in this country. Many men and women in our world can't seem to find their purpose. They don't have a peace. They're not satisfied with their life. They feel incomplete and dysfunctional. And the reason is they're so far removed from God that they can't see him. 
They don't understand that they've been made in God's image, and because they can't see God and they don't know him, they're unable to comprehend who they are and what their purpose in life should be. Some people will ask, who am I? And they'll seek an answer from the wrong people. Most often the answer that they receive is the wrong answer, and they are misidentified. Some are misidentified as homosexuals. Some are misidentified as alcoholics. Some are misidentified as child molesters and predators. Some are misidentified as murderers. Some are misidentified as adulterers and abusers. Do you get what I'm telling you? Some are misidentified as losers and nobody. Some are misidentified as stupid and slow. Some are misidentified as troublemakers. Do you understand what I'm saying? God does not make mistakes. But because perception often becomes our reality, those who have been misidentified conform to the misidentified image instead of conforming to the image of God. Many people in our world have been exposed to bad information and false information. Information is contrary to the word of God. Information that's based upon conjecture and theory instead of fact. And because they're misinformed, they're unable to see a pattern or design for their world or for themselves. If you aren't sure of who you are or where you came from, it's probable that you also have no idea where you're going. If you're convinced that you're the result of an accident or a mistake or a random catastrophe instead of an on-purpose creation of a supreme God, you will be lost and have no idea which direction your life should go. And since perception becomes reality, if somewhere in your life somebody that you trusted has misidentified you and they have labeled you, you will most likely buy into that label and you'll become somebody that God never intended for you to be. Stop letting the world define you. Stop allowing this world to tell you who you are. Today's world don't even know which restroom to use. Don't let a godless world misidentify you. The community that you live in might label you people who don't know you will try to give you an identity. They'll try to control you and manipulate you to do their will with your life, but they don't know who you are. They have no idea who God created you to be. They, they've given you a label, but it doesn't describe who you are as a creation of God, and it is an insult to you. Don't allow this godless world to define you. Be strong enough and be bold enough that when somebody mislabels you to look them in the eye and say, that's not who I am. Many people today have been misidentified. They don't have peace and they feel incomplete and dysfunctional. They're so far removed from God that they no longer know who they are or who they're supposed to be. Our school children attend science class and they're told that they're the result of some random cataclysmic accident. They study their origin and they're told that their great-great-great-grandpa was a baboon. Their value has been reduced to the marks on a grade card or how well they can throw a ball or how pretty they look. They've been exposed to so much bad information and false information that they have lost their true identity. Our world in its godless ignorance is misidentifying people and mislabeling people. And as a result, it has produced the violent horror that we see in the news. The trouble in America today isn't the result of not enough gun laws on the books or not enough money thrown into the problem, but it is the result of godless morals and godless minds misidentifying who God has created them to be. My granddaughter came home from school one day, and she informed me that they now have furries at their school. Have you heard about this? I didn't know what it was, so I asked her if they got an exterminator. Apparently, some school children now identify as animals. She said there's a girl in her class that says she's a cat and she don't talk, she just meows. She told me that there are litter boxes in the school restrooms. Parents, it's time to fight for your children, fight for your school, fight for your community, fight for your country. Stop sitting back and doing nothing and allowing the devil to destroy your kids. Stand up and let your voice be heard and say, no, this is not happening here. Period. It's time that we stop complaining and just take over. Well, that sounds dangerous. YouTube will probably kick this sermon out. The enemy's going to label you. They'll give you a derogatory. Have you noticed the names that people get that oppose the, the, the modern uh, liberal uh, actions of our day? 
They give you a derogatory name. They give you a name that's intended to be an insult to you. You'll be called a homophobe or selfish or arrogant or ignorant or narrow-minded or a fool. And then you will be persecuted. You'll be accused of a hate crime just because you disagree with somebody's stupid idea or their liberal politics. You'll be accused of violating somebody's rights because you refuse to surrender your own. They'll treat you like a criminal and they will threaten to lock you up if you don't shut up. They'll give you an or else. They'll tell you conform or else. Surrender or else. Be silent or else. But that's when you have to stand up in faith and remain true to who you are. You are a child of the living God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, set free from the bondage of sin and liberated from an eternal hell, and you cannot be silent. I am a child of God. I've washed my robe in the cleansing fountain, and I am a child of God. Perception becomes reality. What you think doesn't have to be real or right. But if you perceive it as fact, you will react to it as though it is real, and then you will conform to it. As complicated as this problem may seem, the solution to the problem is a simple one. The book of James tells us that the true reflection of a man can be found by looking into the mirror of God's word. If you truly want to know who you are, if you truly want to know how God made you and why God made you and why he put you on this planet, then you need to look no further than your Bible. But we don't read the Bible anymore, do we? We try to quote it to justify our misinformed opinion. We act like we know what it says when we don't have a clue, but we are totally ignorant when it comes to the Word of God because we don't study it. God always labels his work so that all men can see and know that it was him. Whenever God is involved, he'll leave his signature. Whatever he touches, he'll impress on it his own divine fingerprint. If God is at work, there's no doubt. If it's God's design, everybody knows about it. What God does cannot be confused with the work of anyone else because nobody can do what God can do. The greatest evidence of salvation in someone's life is change. The greatest evidence that someone has truly been repented of their sin and has had their sin curse broken is when they conform to the image and likeness of God, not when they try to conform the Bible to themselves. Becoming a Christian is a life-shattering experience. Old things are passed away. The old misidentified man is dead and the deeds of his flesh are mortified. The obituary is written, the eulogy is spoken, the committal is finished and the gravestone is raised because old things have passed away and all things are new. What evidence do you have today that you're a real Christian? A lot of people say they are. But what evidence do you have that shows that you've met the Savior? What evidence do you have that proves that he has touched your life? Do you have God's divine signature on you? Are you covered in God's fingerprints? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. We always think of Zacchaeus as being physically short in stature. But Zacchaeus' smallness had nothing to do with his height. Too much has been made in our society about height and weight. Our world is so superficial that we place excessive values on appearances. Tall men are hired in executive positions more than short men, even though they might have the same qualifications. Pretty women are chosen over those who are not so pretty. Thin people are deemed as the standard, while those who are overweight are often looked upon as lazy or stupid. Our society misidentifies people all of the time. Zacchaeus didn't like who he was. He was small in his own mind. Zacchaeus' biggest problem was that he believed what people were saying about him. He believed the bad information. He believed the rumors. He bought into the insults. He embraced the image that other people had created for him. And he ultimately became the man that those people said he was. Many people today, young people especially, are being molded and shaped by the insulting words of others. Dad is always telling his son what's wrong with him. Mom is always telling her daughter how bad she is. Brother and sister are always putting them down and making fun of how they look. The kids at school are always teasing. The people on the job have given them a nickname. And the weekend crowd expects them to act a certain way. And the devil's right there daily to confirm it all. So they buy into the misidentified image instead of conforming to the image and likeness of God. The devil's been lying to you. He's been telling you that you are a loser, a nobody, and you're not important. 
He's telling you that you're just like your abusive father. You're just like your drunken mother. He's been telling you that you're too stupid or too weak or too ungifted to become anybody important or to do anything good with your life. And you have believed his lies and now you are conforming to the wrong image. Zach is conformed to the image set for him by the misinformed people. Zach has still hated who he was. And even more, he loathed who he'd become. So one day, Zacchaeus heard about Jesus. He heard about the great change that Jesus had made in people's lives. He heard about how Jesus took an old fisherman and turned them into preachers and how money changers left their tables to follow him. He heard how he took wild men and cast their demons out of them and turned them into loving husbands and fathers. And Zacchaeus said, I need to meet this man. I need to meet this man named Jesus. So in verse 3, it says that there was a big crowd gathering and Zacchaeus couldn't see because he was too short. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. Zacchaeus was organized. He was calculating. He figured out Jesus' route through the city. And so he ran ahead of the crowd and found himself a good seat where he could see and hear everything. But a seat that was far enough away that he could be inconspicuous. Zacchaeus had the back row of the balcony. Jesus walked through the crowd he made his way over to where Zacchaeus was and he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm coming to your house today. The NIV says, I must stay at your house today. And the Bible says that Zacchaeus made haste and he received Jesus joyfully. For the first time in his life, Zacchaeus saw the creator face to face. And for the first time in his life, he was also able to see himself as God saw him and he was instantly changed. Are you having trouble this morning figuring out who you are? Are you confused by all of the information, the misinformation that you've been hearing? Are you struggling to find your identity? Understand that you are a divine creation, handcrafted by God himself. And he's created you with a divine purpose that's one and only yours. You'll never find that purpose in this world, but you will only find it when you look into the, one, the eyes of the one that created you. You say that you're a Christian, but what evidence do you have that proves it? Does your life show that you've been touched by the hand of God? Or are you confused because you're still allowing the world to define you? Look to your creator this morning. Seek God's face. Spend time in his word. Allow him to show you that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. You see, God has a great plan for your life. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't waste years searching in the wrong places and listening to the wrong people. But God directly knows, God knows everything there is to know about you. And go to him directly. He loves you. He created you. And he wants a relationship with you. He wants a real relationship with you. And he wants to see you become the man or woman that he had in mind when he spoke life into you while you were yet in your mother's womb.